Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 8th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the House Finance Committee's proposed budget and things to watch for as it moves to the floor. Second, why both SJR 6, the governor's proposed spending cap, and the Senate Finance Committee's version of the same are ineffective as written and what changes are needed as a result. And third, our thoughts on the Senate Finance Committee's proposed PFD bill. And now let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us right now to discuss the weekly top three, the big three items that we need to talk about. And of course, the biggest item is the elephant in the room, what we were just showing you video of, which was the House Substitute. Uh, of the budget. Uh, Brad, your thoughts on the Finance Committee substitute that the House is voting on uh, and is going to be working from moving forward? Well, Michael, the, the House Finance Committee uh, substitute is is, is interesting um, it, 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 with respect to things they didn't do. Uh, to me, the biggest opportunity in the budget, the biggest, the biggest uh, dollars that you can get your hands on immediately without really doing any significant damage to the state of Alaska is the university budget. Uh, we have, if there's any redundancy, if there's any any excess in state government, uh, it's there. We have three institutions instead of the one contemplated by the Constitution. Uh, we have redundant programs at those three institutions. Uh, that ought to be easy pickings in terms of in terms of uh, reducing cost. When you look at the national average. Uh, cost uh, uh, state spending per full-time uh, equivalent student, which is the standard that's used for these things. The national average is $7,625. Uh, the University of Alaska's spending per full-time equivalent student for FY19 was eight, is $18,627, uh, more than double, uh, about double and a half, about 250%. The adjusted base the House started from uh, was exactly the same thing, $18,627. They brought it down a whopping $600. They brought it down <laughs> from two, 250% of the national average down to 230% of the national average. And that's, I think that's sort of indicative of, of what the, finance, uh, the House Finance Substitute does. Yes, there are some, there are some cuts here and some cuts there. But in terms of, of really getting at the core of Alaska's problem, the, 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 the spending that we've built up over time uh, with the university being the prime example, uh, it, it was, it, it, it's a marginal, the House Finance Committee uh, effort is, is marginal at best. And, and for those who think the governor is cutting you know, the university to, the, to beyond, the, beyond the muscle and into the bone, the governor's proposal is is to cut full-time equivalent spending to eleven thousand dollars. That's still nearly hundred and fifty percent, nearly fifty percent over the national average. So it's not. I mean, the governor's not even bringing it down to the national average. The governor's proposal is to bring it to one hundred and fifty percent national average, um, and the House didn't do anything that even approaches. Or the House Finance Committee didn't do anything that even approaches that. So that's sort of. I, I, I take that as. Frankly, sort of the the talisman, the the the, the test uh, of of any budget, you know what they're doing to the university budget. If they address the university budget, if they get it down to uh, something much more closely, if not equaling the governor's proposal, 150% of of national average spend, spending, 
then then I think we're making progress. To the extent they're just tinkering around at the margins like the House Finance Budget does, uh, we're not really getting at it. Well, and I think that's that's the problem. I mean, they're kind of just toying around with the edges, and they're not even really making that big a difference when it's all said and done. And really, when it was finished, they've still left a seven hundred seven hundred and fifty million dollar hole uh, in the budget. And especially when we talk about the university, I mean, what good are they doing at this point? I mean, UAA just cut their accreditation program. They just said, yeah, we're not even going to go back for the teaching accreditation. So all you people who've done this, you're screwed. Sorry. Have a nice day. Yet they still have three different administrations, three different hierarchies, three different universities, basically under one system, costing us multiples, multiples of what the nas- that national average you were just talking about of, you know, seventy eight, seventy nine hundred dollars And yet University of Alaska Fairbanks is, I mean, they're spending over $30,000 a student there. I mean, it's insanity. It, it, it is. And, and that's really, I mean, the rubber is going to meet the road. I, what I'm really looking for this coming week are the are the votes on the amendments on various things, and and I'm not looking for it as the substance of whether or not those those amendments win. Here's the deal. Here's here's where we're headed. We're headed to a governor line, the governor's line item veto at the end of this process. It will take 16 votes, 16 votes in the legislature, to uphold those vetoes. Um, some of the vetoes are going to be diff- more difficult to uphold than others. Uh, K through 12 probably is going to be uh, a challenging veto to uphold. Uh, but the university should be should be a, among those that that are that are easily upheld. The votes on the House floor on these amendments, to me, are going to start to indicate where those six whether there's going to be 16 votes uh, to uphold. Uh, the veto. The vote yesterday uh, on on whether to adopt uh, the governor's budget as the starting point uh, uh, instead of the um, instead of the proposal coming from House Finance was important uh, because there was there was one defection from the from the Republican minority over to the uh, over to the majority in in considering the uh, uh, the the House Finance version, um, but. In general, the Republican minority stuck together, um, and if they do, that's the that's the 16 votes right there. So it's um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out uh, on the House floor. And keep in mind, as listeners, um, uh, as as they're going through the process, keep in mind what you're really interested in is is whether there's going to be 16 votes to uphold the veto. Uh, on on the various measures as they as they work through. Who was the defection yesterday? I was going to check that, and I totally forgot this morning in getting that Eastman stuff because I knew that one of the members had faltered. Who was it? Do you do you know? Yeah, Laddie Shaw. Laddie Shaw. Uh, yeah, um, went over to the uh, went over to the majority side. Well, and that is really our only hope at this point. I mean, the governor is the line in the sand at this point with his box of red pens to go out there and actually make something happen. But to do something really sustainable, those vetoes have to be override proof. And the only way to do that is, of course, with 15 members of the minority voting in lockstep and at least one, maybe two or three for comfort from the majority or from the Senate also voting in lockstep with the minority at this point to prevent what's going to happen. Um, I mean, the governor was on the program last week, and he said very clearly that he is going to veto what he sees as problematic. And uh, and I think that that's, that's really what we can hope best for at this point, because this seems like this is kind of a done deal, Brad. Well, I don't. I, so the end game of this is going to be is going to be fascinating for those who 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 enjoy the political process or 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 are fascinated by the political process. It's going to be really interesting. The, the here's the here's the problem. The problem is the 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 legislature pass. If the legislature passes something, sends it to the governor, and the governor vetoes it, coming back to the legislature, you've essentially got an up or down vote. You essentially are either voting to uphold the governor's veto, or you're you're voting to 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 go back to uh, the the line item as it was uh, before the governor exercised the veto. And the question is whether the legislature, in the end game, um, is is going to really set these things up badly. For example, are they going to set up the university budget to be you know 200 a continuation of the 250 percent? 
uh, of of the full time equivalent, you know, national average. And and so I would think the legislature would want to come closer to to make some cuts, some significant cuts, to get closer to the governor's uh, to get the governor's position, so that when you get to these veto overrides, uh, the the, the representatives or the people you're dealing with at the margin, the, the, the legislators you're dealing with at the margin are saying, well, you know, maybe maybe 180 percent or, 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 or 175 percent is OK for the university budget as opposed to the 150 percent the governor's insisting on. Um, if the legislature, you know, sets the university budget at 250 percent, then I think it's a fairly easy vote for 16 legislators to back the governor up on his veto. The, if those who are really interested in trying to preserve some of these spending categories, the university being the primary example, really should work to get their to get those those budgets down so that it's a harder choice for the 16. I I don't know how I, I mean, maybe the legislature is just going to say, yep, we're just going to put it all out there. We're going to politically posture um, that we're the good guys and we're going to continue funding for three universities, full funding for three universities or more than full funding, for three universities, and we're going to put it out there at 250%, let the governor veto it, let 16 legislators uphold it, and then we'll just go campaign on it. Maybe that's what they're going to do. Maybe this is going to be political messaging. Maybe Juno's turned into D.C. Um, <laughs> but but if, if we're really concerned about the state of Alaska, uh, we ought to be, and we're really concerned about trying to get our budget under control, uh, those who are putting together the budget in, in the House and the Senate ought to be really trying to get those numbers a lot closer to the governor's uh, uh, veto numbers or the, or the governor's budget numbers to, uh, to, to, to make that decision at the end, uh, whether to uphold those veto overrides, harder uh, on the 16th. Uh, I don't know, you know, when you said you said those of us that enjoy watching the political process or just are fascinated by it, it's kind of like a train wreck. You just kind of can't look away. You know, it's, <laughs> it really is kind of horrific. The House finance bill is 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 really just nothing. I mean, it's really just sort of a proposal that's out there. That's not the end game. The end game is going to be the governor's vetoes and whether those vetoes are upheld. So I think that I think the real for, for, for people who want to be understanding how this is actually coming together, I think the real tell is going to be listening to the discussion on the House uh, of these amendments. Uh, look at the votes on the House of these amendments, uh, the floor amendments on the on the House finance bill and the same on the Senate side and and see whether we're piecing together the 16 that need to be there to uphold the governor's veto when the when the when the vetoes come back. Uh, and I think that's going to be the most interesting thing to watch. How do they balance that? How do they balance getting what they want, they being the House uh, and the majority in the House? How do they get what they want while balancing the power, knowing that the governor uh, will veto and more than likely, depending on how egregious they get, will have the votes to protect and override uh, and still give him something to talk about to his constituency? I mean, he he ran on a full dividend and cutting government. Uh, I mean, how do they walk that line? I, it's going to be I, I, it's going to be fascinating. I mean, you, there's going to be the, the, part of the process that the majority is going to take is to try to create enough public pressure to to on on some of these representatives to 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 prevent them from voting with the governor on the veto override. I mean, you've got some people listening to this segment of the program, some legislators listening to this segment of the program are going to get a lot of public pressure about. Um, uh, not upholding the governor's veto on K through 12, on Medicaid, uh, on uh, uh, on the university, uh, and on other aspects, and they're going to get a lot of cards and letters. And and so the majority's game is going to be create as much passion as they can on their side to for these cards and letters to to descend upon the 16 or the 16 plus uh, to try to create pressure to to uh, to avoid it. I mean, Matsu. Let's take Matsu as an example. One of the campuses that will be hit hard, you can, I can guarantee this, um, uh, if the governor, you, you know, if we drive university spending down to the down to the eleven thousand dollar per full time equivalent student, one of the campuses will be hit hard is Matsu. 
And so the Matsu delegation is going to get a lot of letters, cards and letters about, oh, my God, they're going to close, you know, the Matsu College. There's going to be these professors that don't have jobs. There's going to be these students that are going to have to drive someplace or go someplace. We're not going to have continuing. Education. It's just going to be horrible. That's and, and so the pressure is going to be on the Matsu legislators, whether they uphold the governor's veto uh, or whether they, uh, they 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 flip back to the to what the majority wants to do. Uh, with the university and that's and so that the whole game from here on out is going to be whether they can whether the majority can create enough pressure on those on those 16 or 18 or 20 or whatever it is on on those legislators that want to vote to uphold the governor's veto create enough pressure on them to cave and flip back and go the majority that's that's what this entire it's going to be theater really on the house floor and on the senate floor all related to getting pressure on on those 16. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions in the chat room about the votes out there, including Tammy Wilson's vote. Gary just said she's become a turncoat and most likely will never come on this show again. I disagree. I think she will. She'll want to try and defend her vote. Your thoughts, though, on those that have voted with the majority and who continue to to sustain them now? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a problem. I mean, I can't – Tammy, in 2016, Tammy was the chair – of the university finance subcommittee she voted to cut she led that subcommittee in efforts to cut the university deeply she had language put in the appropriations bill that said university you need to get on the road of getting yourself down to one one institution um and 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 you need to you need to prepare yourself for for that life ahead it, it's it's i mean that's the tammy wilson of 2016 i can't I'm, I'm having trouble reconciling that yeah. to the Tammy Wilson of 2019 that leads the legislature to vote for essentially full funding uh, for the university. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, I think it's definitely problematic. Yeah, she'd propose something like $46 million in cuts to the university uh, and was excoriated for it. Maybe that's part of this. I don't know. Uh, but I know that there is a lot of discontent in the home district with her and several others um, uh, watching that thing yesterday with Chuck Cop carrying the water for the majority in, in batting down Eastman. When I thought Eastman was making some salient points on taking from the permanent fund in the earnings reserve um, was disheartening, to say the least. I mean, these are people that we voted in to supposedly protect us from this kind of chicanery. And yet it's what we're facing right now. One minute left, Brad. Keithley. If, if that's what turned Tammy Wilson, if if. If pressure from the university turned Tammy Wilson from the 2016 to the 2019 uh, version of Tammy Wilson on the university, then that's the very thing you've got to watch for on these 16 coming up on the on the vote because they're going to try to do they will try to do the same thing to those 16. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it is a cautionary tale. We are working on getting Tammy back on the program to explain her votes and talk with us about this. Uh, and uh, if we can't get Eastman on tomorrow, maybe we can get Tammy, because I think it's important that we talk about this. I mean, we've got to talk to them and show them that there is another side, because I think Jacob makes an interesting comment, uh, and I want to get your take on it. Brad's, or, uh, Jacob says, to be fair, UA isn't screwing over its students in Anchorage who are involved in the teaching accreditation field. They're just forcing themselves to work in a model where they will use the other campus, UAF and UAS, who didn't lose their accreditation and learn from Anchorage still by sending professors to Anchorage and wait for it, starting to use online courses to get their degree without increasing the cost. Gasp. It's pushing them into the one university model, and that is somewhat promising to see out of them. Your thoughts? No, exactly right. I mean, exa that's exactly what the university's had to confront with this whole education accreditation debacle. Uh, they've had to they've had to confront how do we how do we fix that? How do we cover for it? How do we how do we how do we use our system to uh, to, to improve on that? And in the course of doing that, they're proving that they can go to a one university system uh, without without any significant difficulty. I mean, if they're going to do it for education, which is sort of the core of the university mission, right? It's to, uh, to create teachers for to teach Alaskans going forward. Um, it, it, if they can do it for education, they can do it for everything. Um, they've proven that before. They've proven that with the remote, remote system they've got that both the, well, all three campuses run with remote institutions um, in various locations throughout the state. They've proven that they can do you know, distributed education, uh, online education, uh, through uh, through these other through these other means. So, yeah, I, I think I think the educate I think having the education debacle 
um, at this point in time is 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 actually <laughs> to some degree fortuitous. I mean, if I were in the legislature, I would be just hitting that over and over and over and over again, you know, saying that this is proving that we can go to a one university system. We this is proving that we can bring these costs down. We don't need three chancellors. We don't need. Uh, three uh, uh, administrations, plus the system administration on top of everything else. We can get down to one university. We can do this uh, in in a fairly. I mean, they they they're they're killing the the UA education the UAA education program immediately. It's not like it's not like they need a phase out of this thing, um, and and that's proving that you can do all of this relatively immediately. Right. Uh, and, and 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 you don't need a phase out. So I. I, I, I think it does uh, uh, prove the theory of getting down to one university, and I, I think the proponents who want to talk about this on the floor uh, want to talk about it in, uh, in, in the Senate Finance uh, Committee and then on the Senate floor. I think they ought to be using that as the perfect example. <laughs> well, that is, of course, if I mean, on the House side, if you can talk about it without being ruled out of order. Um, you know, because you're offending somebody's feelings uh, on what's going on. Uh, pretty amazing, the bullying that's happening um, on the uh, in the House right now. And I guess it's been happening the last two years. And I guess majorities, minorities in one form or another are always some form of bullying, but sometimes it's a little more diplomatic and gentle. Uh, and it seems like this majority is basically just likes to, I mean, they wield a blunt instrument. It's not even subtle. It's just uh, shut up and sit down. We've, we're in control and, and you guys got to suck it, essentially, seems to be the reaction from the majority right now. Well, it's money, Michael. I mean, in the old days, the, the the way they papered over these differences is just to spend more, right? Right. I mean, le leading up to 2014 and even after 2014 when we still had spending or savings, uh, the way you papered over that stuff and made everybody happy was just throw more money at it. Um, I mean, that's how they that's how they got the CBR draws, the CB the Constitutional Budget Reserve draws, which took uh, uh, two thirds of the of the legislature legislature to vote for so those. So they they, they got it by just they by just giving more. They soothe the hurt feelings by just greasing the palms, essentially, of the districts, is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And and what's going on now is we don't have the money to do it, though though you couldn't really tell it from the House finance budget. But uh, we don't really have the money to do it. And so, yeah, it's getting real. I mean, you can't you can't buy people off anymore. Right. Uh, well, I think what's going to be interesting, and again, going back to your comment of kind of watching sport, uh, watching uh, watching politics and the and the legislative process as a spectator sport, what's going to be most interesting to me is how they are going to try and finagle this because they understand. I mean, these are not stupid people. They understand that the governor is probably going to wield the pen, uh, and so they're looking for a way to try and bridge the gap to give him some of what he wants so that he won't cut everything. And uh, and and maybe try and give him a little bit of a bigger dividend, uh, although who knows at this point? I mean, I mean, who knows what's going to happen with that uh, in the end? We got about less than a minute here. Oh, I think the dividends in real peril. Um, uh, I, I think I mean, the governor can't increase the dividends repeat veto. I think the legislature is going to keep the veto down or keep the PFD down, maybe as a bargaining chip with the governor in the end game. Uh, but I think the I think the dividends got a real uh, is is this legislature is is imperiled. I think that the the real focus ought to be on making sure there is a potential to have this game again, fight this battle again with the dividend in future legislatures. Well, we're going to have to see how that works out. I mean, if they continue to not name the funding source and basically just kind of give it a wink and a nod, there may be some hope. But I, I, I don't expect it will survive the uh, process here. I'm with you on this. We're going to have to be watching this closely. Let's move on to item uh, number two, which, of course, is the spending cap and the constitutional spending cap, which we support. You and I both support, although there really have to be some addendums to it and some changes that have to be made. There, there do. Uh, I, I, I am fully in support of a spending cap, a constitutional spending cap. I absolutely think that would be uh, helpful, beneficial, necessary to to make a, to make our fiscal situation work further, but the but the real challenge here is getting the spending cap right. I mean, we have a spending cap in the Constitution, as you pointed out, but it spiraled out of control, um, or it, spi it spiraled way the heck higher than the than the revenues we have underlying it. And and the importance, uh, it, it's important to get the spending cap, uh, get the spending cap right uh, this time before we move forward, and we're not. SJR six, the, the the governor's proposal uh, is, is 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 set up for failure 
the House or the Senate proposal that they just put on the floor and we'll be talking about later this week, week also is set up for failure. They're based on appropriations. We can talk after the break exactly what that means, but they're based on appropriations, not on revenues. So if, if, the, if, if the prior year's appropriations are higher than revenue, uh, the spending cap just ratchets up by inflation for that, for that higher amount, even, even if revenues are, are, are much lower than that. And it also, it, it also doesn't work on the high side. So we can talk after the break about, uh, about, about the, 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 the technicalities of that and the details of that for a bit, but uh, the, the spending caps that we've got right now on the table are not set up to really be successful in controlling spending in the way that it should be. And again, uh, having a spending cap in the Constitution that is ineffectual is is no better than having no spending cap effectively. And we've had statutory spending caps, which the Senate even last year, uh, you know, fought to put in place. But it's nothing more. I mean, talking about virtue signaling and, and emulating Washington, D.C., uh, it's nothing more than political theater. They create the cap and then later on in the same session, they bust the same cap. So what difference does it actually make, to quote a famous politician? That's where we're at kind of with the caps that we have currently. Yep, absolutely right. We just, we just keep it, it, – they're, they're, they're floating up in the stratosphere. The caps that we have keep floating up in the stratosphere someplace, not really matching the reality we have on the ground of our revenue base. And that's exactly what we're – that's exactly the situation we're setting up again uh, with the cap that's in SJR6 and the cap that's uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate's proposal. Brad, your final thoughts here as we continue to talk about this spending cap. What needs to change, and how do we, the people, help change it before we move on to the third? Well, I think I think we need to talk to legislators about changing the, the spending cap to a revenue base. Here, here's the here's the core core of the problem. the The Senate's proposal is to start from five billion. the The governor's proposal in terms of appropriations, and then escalate the the uh, the, the spending cap from there. The, uh, the, the governor's proposal is to take the average of the last three um, uh, appropriations and then escalate by, uh, as changed by the Senate Judiciary, to escalate, escalate by inflation uh, from there. If you take, for example, the House bill as a, the House Finance Appropriations Bill as sort of, as sort of a, a model that you would start with or a number that you would start with, that's $4.4 billion in, in, your, in UGF, $4.4 billion of spending. We have revenues, uh, 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 taking out the dividend, we have revenues of about $3.7 billion. So we're about $600 million or $600 million short of the appropriations. But what the governor's proposal would do would be to take that $4.4 billion, if that's, if that's the number of the appropriations number that works out at the time we start into this, take that $4.4 billion and then escalate by inflation by from there. Well, if you look at the revenue forecast that the state's got, we never get close to to that 4.4 billion, much less the 4.4 billion escalated by inflation. Same problem on the Senate side; it starts from 5 billion. Um, and so the the problem is we're starting with the wrong base. We're using the wrong base uh, to do these spending cap calculations. They ought to be driven by revenue. They ought to be driven by the money we're actually getting into our pocket and doing doing a calculation off revenue. We I've got a we've got a post up at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets that talks about using a five year rolling average of revenue right. um, as the spending cap uh, and ties ties the spending cap then to the actual dollars uh, we're getting we're getting into the door. We're we're gonna have all sorts of distortions created if we if we if we constitutionalize this appropriations based cap it's the same problem we have with the current constitutional provision um and we need it we, we the only way to fix that the only way to to really make a real cap uh that really that relates to the revenues we're getting in the door is to make it a revenue-based cap as opposed to an appropriations-based cap. And so that's where our encouragement needs to lie. We need to be encouraging them to change it from an appropriations-based spending limit to a revenue-based spending limit so that we live actually within reliably within our own means instead of always reaching for this pie in the sky, which is exactly the problem with the current constitutional spending cap is that essentially the cap is way hell and gone from where our actual revenues are, and it effectively caps nothing. Uh, it's pie in the sky. And so instead of repeating those mistakes, if we change it to the five-year rolling average, which sounds 
chronically familiar if we talk about changing the funding on the Charter of Changes. That sounds interestingly familiar, so uh, I, I'm feeling pretty good about that. But Yeah, I, and, it's, go ahead. and it's always based, I mean, a revenue-based cap is always based on revenue that we've had. A five-year rolling average is always based on revenue we've had and presumably is sitting in an account someplace. Um, as as opposed to an appropriations based cap, which is hoping that revenue sort of catches up to whatever the appropriations right. plus inflation has, has gone off to. Right. The if come betting on the if come not a good idea. Working off historical revenues gives us a closer idea. And that's always been my complaint about the revenue projection forecast and everything else. I mean, those things are wrong well over 50 percent of the time. Uh, I mean, how the hell can we ever run a railroad uh, if we're always pretending that we know and it turns out we're wrong over 50 percent of the time? That's not good planning. That is not good planning. Um, all right. So we will encourage our legislators uh, to uh, to uh, to vote this cap in, but to make sure that the change happens, that it goes from appropriations to a five year rolling average of revenue instead. Um, I think that that's a that's a brilliant idea and we should continue to do that. Let's move on to the third and final of our top three. Can't believe it. We actually made it to the third one this time, uh, <laughs> but it's important. It is the proposed change to the dividend formula by Natasha von Imhoff and Bert Stedman, uh, Finance Committee co-chairs in the Senate, uh, which on its face sounds good, but when you dig down into it, not so good. They're proposing a 50-50 revenue split of the POMV draw at 5.25%. Give us your thoughts. It, you know, initially, I, I, I have some sympathy with making the change to make it 50% of the POMV revenue draw. The, 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 the problem with the current, there's a problem with the current statutory way in which we do um, uh, uh, the, the PFD, and it has to do with inflation proofing. We, the, the, Hammond's original vision was 50% to the citizens, 50% to government. The problem is, as it got set up, the inflation proofing, which is the portion that needs to go back into the permanent fund to make sure the permanent fund at least tracks with inflation, um, the, the portion related to inflation proofing gets taken out entirely of the government's 50%. So instead of a 50-50 split between citizens and government, what you really end up with is a 75% uh, split. When you, look, when, when you take out inflation proofing, it's really 75% to citizens, 25% to government. Some might think that's okay. The more to citizens, the better. The problem with that is if you don't give government, as oil prices decline and oil revenues decline, if you don't give government its 50% split, you're creating the pressure for income taxes. You're creating pressure for taxes uh, to, close that, to close that gap. Um, so I have some sympathy for the concept of a 50-50 split. But the Senate's bill isn't, I mean, the proposal from Natasha von Himhoff is not, is not the right way to do it. There's a, there's a couple of big problems with it, the first of which is it's statutory instead of constitutional. So the, the, stat, and the statutory language already changes the shall that we have in the current statute that says the, the permanent fund corporation shall send that 50%, that, uh, that share of earnings uh, to the, uh, for distribution uh, through the PFD changes that word to may. So the legislature, the, the bill already gives the, 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 the legislature the out to, uh, to short pay the, uh, the PFD, even the 50-50 PFD. And then uh, it's a statute instead of a, constitu a constitutional provision, what they're proposing. And, and we already know what statutes mean that in, in, a, in the finance context, they're worthless. They mean nothing because the legislature can just override it. So for those two, for, for that reason, uh, alone, uh, the proposal from the Senate is, is, isn't worth much. On top of that, there's a problem, and this sort of goes back to the same problem that we have with the, with the spending cap. There's a problem in, in, the, in the draw rate they're using in uh, that bill, and, there, and it's the same problem they've got in SB 26. They're using a fixed draw rate of 5%, which is a projection uh, of what the permanent fund is like, may earn, uh, going forward. So you take a 5% draw rate because that reflects the anticipated real rate of return, the after inflation rate of return that the permanent fund is going to earn going forward. The, the, the problem with that is it doesn't reflect what the permanent fund has earned in the past. If you look over the past history of the permanent fund, 
permanent funds earned about a 6% real rate of return uh, over time. So if you're only paying out 5% and the permanent funds earning six or is earned 6%, what's happening is you're really taking a percent, a full percent of earnings, and that can add up dollars, taking a full percent of earnings, leaving it in the permanent fund, instead of distributing it in term, in, in, in of PFDs to the citizens, um, and in form of in the form of the other fifty percent to uh, to government, um, and that's and that's a problem. I mean, you're really shortchanging the current generation. You're putting more money in there is to the benefit of the future generation, but you're really putting more pressure on the current generation to to tax itself or have to do something to come up with the additional funds or 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 reduce government services below where they need to be reduced um, uh, in order to account for that that short pay uh, in the draw rate. So. Just like uh, with the uh, uh, with the spending cap, I think we ought to be using the the rolling average of the last you know some period of time. Probably in the case of the permanent fund, it's 15 years or so to to smooth out the edges. The rolling average of what the permanent fund is actually realized, the the rate of return the permanent fund is actually realized, as opposed to this artificial five percent. Uh, uh, draw rate that uh, that the uh, uh, both P, uh, both uh, SB 26 and this new bill uh, incorporate. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. If you're not following his Facebook page or subscribe to his Facebook page, you need to do it now because he drops the truth bomb on you pretty much daily throughout the week. Uh, check it out, Brad. Thank you so much as always for coming on board. Uh, you contribute a tremendous amount to the show, and we appreciate it. Michael, thanks for having. Me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith, Lake Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.